Leia's here early because she knows this one's extra terrible. So last time I let you vote for what I was going to review next. And I told the internet, do your worst, which is like saying, do your worst to a firing squad. The people voted and now I'm stuck reviewing After by Anna Todd. You may also notice that I've redecorated the book throne a little bit. Uh, you see what happened is I, I opened up this book and I shook it a little bit and all these red flags just fell out. After is the story of a naive girl going off to college and meeting an impressively terrible, toxic person and somehow falling in love with him. I really can't express the, the story any other way. This is, in terms of romance, this is really bottom of the barrel. And not just because this was originally a fan fiction, we'll get to that in a minute, but because the characters in this, Hardin Scott and Tessa Young, may be one of the most awful dysfunctional couples I've ever come across to the point where I would honestly sing praises of Edward and Bella before I said anything nice about these two. The couple in this is so bad that I would actually have to give props to L. James and the Mister for writing a comparatively better couple. They're dysfunctional, it doesn't make any sense, but at least Trevelyan's not outwardly abusive. The bar has been lowered to depths we can't even fathom. Oh, but you will see just how awful these two really are together. And it's not exclusively that the, uh, the man in this, man in this, Harden is an outwardly antisocial little twerp of a loser. It's that the protagonist is also kind of naive to the point of unbelievability, and she has her own set of really negative qualities, none of which I like. We're not talking flaws that can be excused and answered with, oh, well, it's just part of the character arc. We're talking she does terrible things, and the author never addresses them or treats them like they're out of the norm, which really Makes me wonder what her personal values are, but okay. Anyway, After by Anna Todd is one of the strangest, I guess you could call it rags to riches sort of story out there. Because this was originally a fan fiction dedicated to the band One Direction. One Direction, if you don't remember, was a boy band that was popular for a few minutes a couple of years ago. I mean, they're no Backstreet Boys, but then again, who is? And the author was somewhat infatuated by the uh, the lead singer I get or no the one of the guys I whatever Harry Styles who has since gone on to be in a few movies that I actually liked I didn't actually know that he was in Dunkirk when I first saw it but he wasn't bad well the story of Anna Todd herself is kind of an interesting one if only because you're watching somebody fail upwards she herself had a very meager uh, start uh, married her high school sweetheart uh, had to work like two jobs in order to make ends meet, had two kids, and in what spare time she had, she enjoyed reading. Okay, not a bad start. Sounds like she might actually be a good person, all things considered. And one thing I found in an interview of her is that she wanted a particular type of story, but couldn't really find it. I've always been a reader, but at this point I only wanted to read fan fiction, and I went through almost all of them, and I couldn't find one that was being updated or completed or anything so I was like oh maybe I'll just write like a chapter. So she took the task upon herself and started writing what would become known as After and it was a surprise success. She started publishing on the website Wattpad which is like the less elegant version of fanfiction.net where you can publish not only fan fictions, but original stories. Not a bad tool for a beginning writer, as long as you remember that there are no real quality checks in place. And after swept the scene, uh, becoming ridiculously popular for reasons that I'll get into later, I have my own headcanons for why this worked as well as it did, to the point where the series eventually bled into five full books, and these are not small ones either, Second book is over 800 pages, which, considering the pacing of this thing, is ridiculous to me. And one was a lazy prequel, but I'm not talking about that one. I don't want to. 
to the point where the After series received over a billion individual views. Quality aside, that is astonishing. It's a little uncomfortable when you realize that this is effectively a story of her self-insert falling in love with Harry Styles, who at the time she wrote this was 16. Simon & Schuster got wind of how popular this was and wanted to capitalize on it by producing a physical copy of the series. Obviously there was some concern about that because why would you buy a physical copy when you can already get a copy of it online for free? But it worked out for them because they managed to make a very safe investment considering how dedicated Todd's fans are. And she was offered a six-figure book deal which is absurd. Now I can't blame Todd for taking that kind of a money. You're given a six-figure book deal for something that you've already written and don't really have to change that much. As far as I can tell, this is almost a one-to-one -one translation from what she wrote online. Who wouldn't take that deal? That's incredible. I'd be sorely tempted at that kind of a deal. So she took the money, uh, became an overnight success, as it were. Uh, she has had her books turn into now two movies, uh, I've seen the first one. It's god-awful. I believe I likened it to every single romantic trope I've ever seen to the point where if you distilled just the tropes out of the movie, you've got nothing left. Oh, but the movie softened the blow because I was not prepared for how awful this book was. Not just in terms of the abuse I've mentioned, but also bad quality writing. You see, while Simon & Schuster uh, did make a lot of money, it didn't really do a lot in my eyes for their quality checking because this is almost impressively amateurish. I haven't seen a misstep from a publishing house since Michael Crichton's posthumous title, Pirate Latitudes. And if you're not aware of the disaster of Pirate Latitudes, this was originally an incomplete manuscript that was discovered in Michael Crichton's desk after his death in 2009, unfortunately the publishers decided to, instead of just hire somebody to finish it, publish it more or less as it was, neaten a few things up here and there, and release it on shelves. And it was a disaster. Not because it's a bad story. It's about privateers in the Caribbean in the 17-1800s going around and hunting a particular ship. It's actually, at its core, a good story. And told the way that Crichton tells all the stories, so I enjoyed it. But there are scenes that go nowhere, there are character arcs that fall flat. At one point, the team of heroes come across a sea monster, the protagonist jumps on its eyeball, and then gets back on the ship, and then by the next chapter they act like none of that ever happened. It is truly bizarre. But because of the success of the book, Anna Todd is going off and is partnering with Wattpad to create her own publishing house. You know, small little thing. But I would hesitate to work with her myself, because she's not very good. And I'm not saying that to hate on her or someone who is really passionate about her story. The problem is, there are so many elements that I don't think she understands how they come across. For example, this is supposed to be a love story involving one of the guys from One Direction. And going through this book, I honestly couldn't tell you if she hates Harry Styles or not. The male love interest in this book is so terrible, depicted so poorly, that Harry Styles fans themselves, when this book was published, were up in arms about how badly he was portrayed in the story. And you know what? I don't blame them. Sorry, I got a little bit of a misconception here. What the fuck are you trying to write? It's one of those things where it's a slow burn. He starts out obnoxious and then it gets worse and worse and worse. And the book is not aware of how he actually comes across. Same thing with Tessa, the protagonist. She starts out as naive and she makes a mistake and then she makes a different mistake, and then she makes a worse mistake, and she just keeps getting worse and worse as the story progresses. And honestly, that wouldn't be too bad character. It'd be very, very interesting if it was intentional! And that could make for a good story. This could be a very good cautionary tale aimed at young women who need to be aware of some of the dangers of going into college. Honestly, I miss the days when we thought Bella Swan was as bad as it got, because we've been getting more and more crap like this recently, and it's just the the quality of writing in general is just nose diving. Now, something else this book is good for is pointing out the necessity of proper research. For example, one uh, since we've mentioned him already, Michael Crichton 
uh, wrote a book called Next on genetics and the idea of patenting genes. To do this idea properly, he did a lot of research. He has a bibliography in the back of the book. It is eight pages long. Now, the reason I bring that up is because this is a college romance story written by a woman who has never gone to college. Now, that in and of itself is not a disqualifier. No one I am aware of has ever traveled through time, and we've got plenty of time travel stories. Some of them are even good. The problem is, if you're going to write about something outside of your expertise, you should at least do the bare minimum amount of research, because it is very, very obvious that Todd has maybe never even seen a college campus before. Although I can't find anything that definitively states that she's never been to college, the way that she treats college makes it pretty obvious that she's never attended or maybe even been to a campus. Now, I wanna make it perfectly clear, just because you have a college degree doesn't make you smarter or better than anyone else. Some of the dumbest people I've ever met in my life have had college degrees. And a number of the events that happen in this story could have been roughly gleamed by watching a few movies, maybe, and assuming that college is more or less like high school. Spoilers, it is not. Not. College is high school without the seatbelts. Now, Tessa herself is a very simplistic character type. She fits the fish out of water trope to such a degree that I'm not sure that she actually has any socialization skills. She might not even know what the internet is. Oh, and this was written in 2014, so Facebook was a thing, and somehow still is. The other aspect of her, aside from being incredibly ill-prepared for college, is that she likes books. Normally, I would love a character like that. Part of the reason why Alan Wake is one of my favorite video games and why I'm so anticipating Alan Wake 2 is because the protagonist is a writer. But Todd doesn't understand what makes great writing, and I'm not just saying that because of how badly written this book is. It's also because she tries to tie in other stories and create parallels between after and, most prominently, Pride and Prejudice. The problem with Todd is that she'll lift these story ideas without actually understanding them. So you'll get particular elements that are cosmetically similar to other stories, but don't actually have the same weight or impact or originality. It's like reading a book by Julia Quinn if she forgot how to write. I'll steal it! No one will ever know! So the way that the book tries to use certain elements and uh, literary analysis from Pride and Prejudice is shockingly bad. There is actually a chapter, which we will get to in this, in this uh, video, where Tessa and Hardin go back and forth uh, arguing over the characters in Pride and Prejudice, uh, Mr. Darcy and Elizabeth, and it is one of the dumbest analyses I have seen, and it's so bad that I'm not convinced that Todd ever actually read Pride and Prejudice. Then again, it's not like she had time to really consider a lot of what she did. This book was written in the span of about a year and at almost 100 chapters. That means that Todd was writing almost two chapters a week. Dedicated, certainly, but there's no real time for planning or organization or really gathering your thoughts. One could almost say that this book meanders and weaves back and forth through so many things so many times that it was written without direction. Now, I have been bashing on this book for quite a bit, and I I got a lot more coming, but I want to at least be fair in my breakdown. There are some things that are actually done well in this book. For example, Tessa's backstory and the way that that's explored and revealed throughout the story. I do think that there are some interesting elements, especially as she slowly realizes how much her mother was controlling her. Or, more specifically, how she reveals it to the reader, and now that she's got a degree of independence since she's in college away from her mother, she actually is able to explore new ideas. Now, I'm going to have to apologize ahead of time because given the haphazard way this book was written, I'm going to have to jump around a little bit to properly explain things. The first several chapters are extremely introductory. And while I do think that Todd's writing style and delivery improved, looking purely at a technical level, as the story progressed, there are a lot of things that are lacking. For example, her utilization of detail. Part of the reason I think that this book succeeded as much as it did is because it has a breakneck pace, so a lot of things happen very quickly. The jangling keys effect, as it were. 
The lack of detail made it easy for inexperienced readers to fit themselves into the story alongside or in place of Tessa, kind of like how Twilight was originally. Turns out there are some sex scenes, and no one warned me about those, so thanks all of you who voted for this. And the final note of why I think this is successful is because this story is actually written at a second grade level. Between the simplistic descriptions and the low quality vernacular, it is very easy to breeze through this book. It reads very quickly because there's nothing to make you stop and consider things or rethink how everything actually formulated. There are no detailed descriptions, like to the point where I couldn't tell you what Tessa's dorm room looks like. I could tell you elements that are inside of it, but I couldn't tell you how any of it was arranged. So as we're going through this, you might as well fit in your own school. Even if it's like a middle school, you're probably not far off. But I'm going to do what I can in order to try to keep this as trim and concise as possible. This is actually my third attempt uh, filming this review because this is impressively difficult to talk about and still make interesting. Let the memes flow. This is the after disaster. So the book opens with a prologue, kind of an after the events of the entire series recap of things. And while that would be fine normally, it starts off with a degree of pretentiousness over the importance of college that I've never come across before. College had always seemed so crucial, such an essential part of what measures a person's worth and determines their future. We live in a time where people ask which school you went to before asking your last name. I graduated college more than a decade ago. I've literally never had that happen to me once. In my personal experience, most people don't even ask about college at all unless you're relating stories to one another. I am honestly not sure where Todd got this idea, but it's ridiculous. You would think that if an author weighed college so heavily, they would have done a better job trying to research the college experience, but we'll get to that later. So Tessa reveals that she has been preparing for college since her first day of high school. Apparently everything revolved around getting into college. And her mother had it in her mind that she attend Washington Central University, the same school that she attended but never completed. WCU seems to be a made-up school, as far as I can tell, possibly inspired by Central Washington University, a real school that boasts that it has one of the, let me make sure I got this right, the largest university in Washington state and the 12th largest in the nation. Something I just realized is it really doesn't feel like that large of a, okay, so there's something to be said about the sense of scale of something. I know I keep coming back to Crichton, but in Jurassic Park, once they got to the island, you got a pretty good idea of how few people there actually were because you had the occasional extra worker, you know, more than what you saw in the movie, but not too many, and there were still in isolated pockets. So it felt small. There was a sense of scale there, um, which made the threat of the dinosaurs getting loose all the more dangerous. I couldn't tell you the class size of Washington Central University. I couldn't tell you anything of descriptive of Washington Central University. There's no sense of scale or description or any particular landmarks, no sense of culture, no sense of collegiate identity. I know I, I keep setting things, things up. I... Mm. There, there's, there's so much wrong with this book in so many ways. So the rest of the prologue is just Tessa rambling about, you know, how uh, trivial things like picking out her classes seems now that she's looking back in retrospect, how important and impactful Harden was on her life. All that I'm certain of is that my life and my heart will never be the same, not after Harden crashed into them, with all the grace and elegance of a deflating elephant. Chapter one begins the day that Tessa is set to leave for college. Appropriate enough, you get a little bit of an idea of who she is before she gets set into this new environment, which normally I would approve of, except some of the setup doesn't really last. For example, Tessa is nervous and spent half the night awake. Understandable, moving to college is a big deal. However, others may count sheep. I plan. My mind doesn't allow a break from planning, and today, the most important day in my entire 18 years of life is no exception. Now, ignoring for the moment how 
clunky and awkward that sentence was, you will almost never see Tessa actually plan anything ever again. I don't like it when an author will set up something notable about their character and then drop it immediately. If you're not going to utilize it, don't put it into your story. If it's not going to actually reflect on the character in any discernible way, don't bother with it, because then you can focus on the things that do impact their character. This is like the live-action Beauty and the Beast thing they did where Belle was turned into an, uh, an inventor, which in and of itself is a fine idea, except she never does anything with it. Why set that up? To, to demonstrate that she's smart? She already reads lots of books and can outthink anyone in the village. Why do you need to go a step beyond in an unnecessary direction. Now, one thing that I've uh, mentioned previously is Tessa's lack of social grace. It doesn't seem like she has a lot of friends, and part of that is because of lines like this. I spent the last few years nervously anticipating this. I spent my weekend studying and preparing for this, as my peers were hanging out, drinking, and doing whatever else it is teenagers do to get themselves in trouble. So we get a touch of the, I'm not like other girls, aspect, which I guess does fit within the confines of the story, but only because she is very much the fish out of water thanks to who her roommate associates with. At the same time, she just got to set herself up in what really comes off as a snobbish direction, like, oh, th the other teenagers were off being naughty. I wasn't. I was a good girl. I don't know why my voice deepened when I said that. Look, college is a marvelous time to get out there and take risks, accept challenges, maybe get in trouble every once in a while. You can do the same thing in high school. Hell, when I was in high school, my buddies and I would allegedly sneak onto construction sites, steal nails and plywood, and then make bike ramps out of them. Again, allegedly. Can't prove shit, I was a minor. We also get a line where Tessa says that money is apparently an issue in her family, which, again, could be a great setup for some characterization later on. If it actually carried through with anything. I got into the only college I applied for, and because of our low income, I had enough grants to keep my student loans to a minimum. I had once, for just a moment, considered leaving Washington for college. But seeing all the color drain from my mother's face at the suggestion, and the way she paced around the living room for nearly an hour, I told her I really hadn't been serious about that. Now, one thing that I don't fault Todd for not knowing this because she didn't attend college, is the idea of in-state uh, tuition, which normally significantly reduces your tuition rates. Uh, instead of paying 24,000 a semester, you might pay 8,000 a semester. The main reason I bring that up is the concept of money. The way that Tessa sets up the importance of her family's low income. She had to go get a job when she was 16 to help make ends meet and save her for college. Understandable. And those are good things to have for a character. But it doesn't stay around. Just like the planning thing, this is something that gets mentioned and almost immediately dropped, especially in how the mother treats herself. The mother has to look as presentable and fancy as possible, and it really sends a conflicting message. So money is tight, but the mom goes out on spa trips regularly and has really nice clothes. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, I'm not even saying that that's necessarily a bad habit. As long as you're careful with your money, go right ahead. But the problem is this sends a conflicting image. Is money an issue or is money maybe a little tight? Not that it matters because it almost never comes up ever again. It's also very risky to apply to only a single college. You gotta be putting out for like five just to be safe. They're called safety schools for a reason. Moving on, we also have Noah who is hanging around to help Tessa move. Uh, Noah is Tessa's boyfriend, who is one year younger and plans on joining Washington College University uh, next year. The chapter ends with, I have no idea what college will be like, and unexpectedly, the question that keeps dominating my thoughts is, will I make any friends? Now pay attention to the way that that was actually phrased. It's not, will I make any new friends, it's, will I make any friends? which makes me wonder about her current friend situation. Again, I don't know if this is intentional because it's never actually detailed, but it sounds like Tessa doesn't really have any friends. It's really just 
her mom, and Noah. And considering that throughout the entirety of this book, we never get any references to prior relationships or friendships, I'm starting to think that she was some sort of a weird, isolated loner. And I can't believe that I actually glossed over this in my notes, but the story is written in present tense, uh, first person, present tense, which in and of itself isn't a bad thing, but I'm growing to detest that writing style because it is almost never actually utilized properly. You use present tense to keep the reader in the moment alongside the protagonist as the story is happening. But a lot of that depends on significant detail in order to keep the audience uh, engaged in the story. And because Todd uses so little detail, you can't actually find yourself in the same situation as the protagonist. It is a self-defeating writing style to write present tense and give no detail. Anyway, it is a two hour drive to campus, which they make quickly, fine, whatever. Except we get this line that really annoys me. I wish I could say that the familiar scenery of my home state calmed me as we drove, or that a sense of adventure took hold of me with each sign that indicated we were getting closer and closer to Washington Central. But really, I was mostly in a daze of planning and obsessing. I hate that it doesn't give you that detail. What familiar scenery? Trees? Is there a particular landmark she passed? So we get a bit of characterization as Tessa's mother insists that she and Noah accompany Tessa to freshman orientation and I would like to see your dorm room before we head out. I need to make sure everything's up to par. So between that and heels that are described as outrageously high, you get an idea of who Tessa's mother is. She is this controlling helicopter parent who I wouldn't say wants the what is best for her baby, but wants what's best for her baby as long as it's within a certain guideline that she has pre-approved. And any uh, deviation from that path is seen as horrible and unacceptable, as you can tell from the mother's reaction when they meet Tessa's roommate, Steph. Now, Steph herself seems pretty amicable, at first, she introduces herself nicely, says, Welcome to WCU, where the dorms are tiny and the parties are huge. You know, trying to make a bit of a joke out of it, but she is wearing what I would call punk light. She has bright red hair, eyes lined with what looks like inches of black liner, and arms covered in colorful tattoos. And apparently a top that uh, really exposes her cleavage. Jumping ahead for just a moment, Tessa's mother overreacts by saying, You will not room with someone who allows men in like that. Those punks at that. So it feels like Tessa's mom is going for some version of sterility here to the point where men aren't even allowed in Tessa's dorm. Unfortunately, some of that judgment seems to have affected Tessa as well because one of the guys, Nate, introduces himself as he... Uh, as he walks in to visit Steph, and he seems quite friendly at first. His blonde hair is styled straight up and there are sections of brown peeking through. His arms are scattered with tattoos and the earrings in his ear are the size of a nickel. I'm Nate, don't look so nervous, he says with a smile, reaching out to touch my shoulder. You'll love it here. His expression is warm and inviting despite his harsh appearance. Why don't you shut your trap, you judgmental cotton candy tit having bitch! This is also the first time Tessa sees Harden, who just stands there antisocially and isn't even given a name. I expect him to introduce himself the way that his friend did, but he stays quiet, rolling his eyes in annoyance and pulling a cell phone from the pocket of his tight black jeans. He definitely isn't as friendly as Steph or Nate. He's more appealing, though. Something about him makes it hard to tear my eyes from his face. I'm vaguely aware of Noah's eyes on me as I finally look away and pretend I was staring out of shock, because... That's what it is, right? Now, Harden Scott is an obvious write-in for the original Harry Styles. You can see the similarity in their names. I don't really like the name Harden Scott. It doesn't sound like a name so much as something you would tell your boyfriend when he's having trouble getting it up. So after a lengthy discussion about the dangers of college and college men, Tessa uh, says goodbye to her mother and Noah, and there's something that I had to skip over earlier because of time. But Tessa inhales some of Noah's cologne and doesn't really give it any description. The way that it was originally listed is that he just has excessive cologne. Now, 
Something that I don't see utilized very often in writing is the sense of smell. Uh, we get all sorts of things about the touch of wind, how vibrant uh, mountain pastures or skies are, how uh, certain flavors taste, but oftentimes smell is left at the wayside. Two books that I recently enjoyed that utilize the sense of smell pretty effectively are Eon and Iona. Now, I'm skipping a lot of details, but one of the things that uh, Alison Goodman does well is you have this, I'll just call it a council of advisors called the Dragon Eyes. And the protagonist uh, gets to join the, uh, the council. One thing that's unique about the Dragon Eyes is that they all have a unique smell that is associated with their particular dragon. They, they commune with dragon spirits. The protagonist, for example, uh, has a dragon that smells of cinnamon. And there's uh, a rival dragon eye who smells of oranges. Not even within the confines of the smell of oranges wafts from around the corner so they knew the rival dragon eye is there. No, it gives a sense of weight and a sense of world building that I don't see very often, but I rather enjoyed. And so I recommend that everyone at least consider utilizing a sense of smell because there's just something deeper and more realistic about how well it can be applied. And also read these books, they're fun. I would recommend the audiobooks too, that's how I listen to them. They were quite fun. But anyway, uh, during the farewell, we get a little bit of insight that suggests that Tessa's mother has been poisoning her mind for a while. Noah is only a few inches taller than me, but I like that he doesn't tower over me. My mother used to tease me growing up, claiming that a man grows an inch for every lie he tells. I don't think the mother's really supposed to be painted as like a particular sexist or anything. I think that she just has a lot of animosity towards Tessa's father, who left when Tessa was 10. So they leave and Tessa is finally on her own. And the next day, uh, before classes have started, Tessa discovers that the bathrooms uh, in her dorm are all not just communal bathrooms, but they're co-ed communal bathrooms, which I had never heard of before. Apparently they are a thing in a few colleges, not too many, but eh. And when she gets back from using it this time, Harden is waiting on Steph's bed for some reason. And Steph isn't there, which is kind of creepy. Why is he in their dorm? Why didn't Steph mention this? Why doesn't Harden leave when Tessa asks him to? Well, could you like, leave or something so I can get dressed? He hasn't even noticed I'm in a towel. Or maybe he has, and it doesn't impress him. Don't flatter yourself. It's not like I'm gonna look at you. Don't worry, I'm not gonna do that voice for Harden the entire review, but he is such an insufferable little twit. And considering that is his second line of dialogue in the entire book, the first one being, he doesn't know where Steph is. He is not off to a good start. And unfortunately, Tessa is so much of a doormat, a problem that will persist throughout the story, that she doesn't really push back against this and say, get the hell out or I'm calling campus security. She just gets changed, hoping that he doesn't turn around. Well, Steph walks in, somehow already hungover. Uh, she begs Tessa to join her in going to that weekend's frat party. And the frat party itself is just this miserable spiral of what the hell is going on. So the events of the frat party go on for like the next six chapters, and a lot of it is stuff that you need to understand for later on, but a lot of it is like really tedious, so I'm just gonna shotgun my way through this as fast as possible. So the frat party itself is never named, it's just the frat house it is ridiculous for something like what is modeled supposedly after the 12th largest university in the country would have only the one frat is weird to me but it's also very far off campus and on my campus the frat houses were kind of off in one section but they were within walking distance this one is I'm assuming about three miles away from campus because later in a scene, Tessa has to walk back to her dorm and it takes her about an hour and a half. So 
three miles at the minimum. And Steph and Tessa will be getting a ride from Nate, the friendlier guy from earlier and not Harden, which Tessa is pleased about. I'm grateful it won't be Harden, even though I know he will be there. Somehow riding with him seems unbearable. Why is he so rude? If anything, he should be grateful that I'm not judging him for the way he has destroyed his body with holes and tattoos. <laughs> Now, in preparation for the frat party, we get one of the only things that Todd ever actually details. Clothing. We get this full description of what Steph is wearing, a brisk description of what Tessa is wearing, and if I had to overanalyze the moment, I would say that this is Tessa looking at the situation with blinders on. She's so used to her own world, her own things, that she doesn't feel the need to really describe them in detail. But Steph and her lifestyle is so different that it demands exploration. Now, do I think that that's actually what's going on? Not really. I think that more likely Todd is just more interested in the idea of the punk aesthetic as opposed to the good girl Sunday best dress that Tessa ends up going with. Apparently it's her favorite dress. The party just starts off rough when Harden addresses Tessa as Teresa and Tessa says, please don't call me Teresa, I prefer Tessa. And he responds, sure thing, Teresa, which is just needlessly antagonistic. Harden is going out of his way to be obnoxious. A character point, which is going to uh, be marked against him in a number of ways. I haven't even started on that, but it gets really interesting in how badly Todd portrays him. And I'm calling her Tessa, not out of a sign of respect, but because if I called her Teresa, I would be getting Empress Teresa comments. Stop it, I know you're thinking it. They also meet another guy named Zed who asks Tessa what her major is. A normal question, sure. And she states that she's an English major, which is going to be one of the only definable qualities about her as a character, but keep that in mind. We're gonna be coming back to it later. And then he says, awesome, I'm into flowers, which is an attempt at a joke. And I'm gonna be honest, I don't get it. Because unless that's a flowers for Algernon joke or a joke about flower pressing, it doesn't make sense. And the book never brings it up again. I admit I could be wrong. This, is, this could be a reference that even I don't understand, but I think that Todd was going for some sort of a weird inside joke and didn't realize how few people would actually understand it. Feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, though. So, during the party, there's a lot of drinking, there's a lot of commingling with others. It's not really Tessa's scene, though. Remember, she is very much an isolated kid. Uh, so, her best thing is to reach out to uh, Noah and, you know, say that she, she misses him. At one point, somebody has a party foul and spills a drink all over her dress. And while she's going around looking for a bathroom to clean up in, she comes across one of the bedrooms, inside of which Harden is making out with a girl with pink hair. The girl with pink hair is named Molly. She will be more prevalent throughout the book, but that's not just me being random and mentioning that it will come up later. She decides she wants to try to leave, so she tries to find Steph. Turns out Steph is already drunk and is dancing provocatively with a man. She, along with two other girls, are dancing on a table in the living room. A drunk guy climbs up and joins them, his hands gripping her hips. I expect her to swat his hands off, but she smiles and pushes her bottom against him. How scandalous! The moment reminds Tessa of she and Noah have never gone that far, and they've been uh, dating for two years. Well, Steph herself is a very sloppy drunk and is already completely wasted, which demonstrates that either she's an incredible lightweight or Todd doesn't know how to actually establish timing in a story. Because it feels like almost nothing has actually happened. So I couldn't tell you how long this party has been going for. See, while the quick pacing is good for the younger audience reading this, at the same time, it doesn't really establish itself very well because you can't tell how much is happening how quickly. It's kind of a mess. Well, since Nate is the one of the only people that Tessa knows here, he, uh, she goes to him for advice, and he says that she just needs to sleep it off. So he puts her and uh, Tessa in a random bedroom. A bedroom which is adorned with a very impressive library collection, apparently. And this is one of the more pressing moments where the lack of detail really annoys me. I turn on a lamp and look around the room. 
my eyes immediately going to the bookshelves that cover one of the walls. Since this perks my mood up, I go over to it and scan through the titles. Whoever owns this collection is impressive. There are many classics, a whole range of different types of books, including all of my favorites. Spying Wuthering Heights, I pull it off the shelf. It's in bad shape, the binding giving away how many times it's been opened. So we haven't gotten an ounce of detail in almost anything in this entire story. Unfortunately, this is where it just kind of comes to an obvious halt, because not only are we not getting any detail to any of the books here, despite t uh, Tessa's apparent appreciation for literature, but she goes and she talks about Wuthering Heights, which is not a bad story. I haven't read it myself, but I plan on it eventually. It's one of those classics that unfortunately has become the tool of stupid people attempting to sound smart. Aren't these just buzzwords that dumb people use to sound important? It's not that she just doesn't even name any other titles. We don't get any other authors. We don't even get any kind of genres. No indication as to what these other books even could be. It's just a couple of classics. And there is some attempt later on to utilize Wuthering Heights as a comparison and a parallel to after, but aside from a quick name drop of Heathcliff and Catherine, you don't really get that association between the two of them. It is, it is another mess. It's, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Anyway, there is a bit of confusion as Tessa is lost in Emily Bronte's words uh, to the point where she doesn't notice when the door opens and someone steps in and asks, why the hell are you in my room? And it turns out the person talking is Hardin. Now, Hardin is part of this frat somehow, and we get from a description later on that he is the only one who lives in this particular room. It is a uh, just the one bed. Which raises the question, why was he making out with the pink haired girl in the other bedroom? Is that just like a communal hookup room? Or is it totally normal for frat brothers to hook up with girls on other people's beds? Hopefully there are some frat boys in the comments who can confirm that this is in fact as weird as I think it is. It also raises the question, why did Nate put Steph in here if like it wasn't okay? Harden tries to kick Tessa and Steph out, ends up succeeding because no one stays in his room even though he and Steph are friends, and it just keeps being incredibly toxic. If you're trying to say that you want to make out with me, sorry, you're not my type. Here's a fun game. See how long it takes us to get to a point where Harden has a single redeemable trait about him. And I'm not talking like the bare minimum, like you see somebody drowning, so you toss them a life preserver. That's expected. I mean something that is, in and of itself, independently positive. Well, we're waiting. Well, this whole situation with a drunk roommate, no real ride home, uh, no one around that she knows, and Harden being a little bitch, Tessa breaks down and has a cry. Understandable. This is a very stressful situation. At a later scene, Tessa in fact feels so off-put by Harden that she actually has to state, I'm begging you, if you have one decent bone in your body, you will leave me uh, be. Just save whatever mean comment you are going to say for tomorrow, please. McSteamy. Oh, yes. Eventually, Harden takes them back to the dorm, which raises the question, why didn't he do that earlier instead of dumping Steph into a different bedroom? But I guess we had to just get some more pointless drama out. But the party concludes, Tessa hated it, the rest of the weekend passes, and eventually it's time for college classes to begin. It is a whole different disaster. So Tessa's first class is a freshman history class. What are they studying specifically? How difficult? What level is this? I don't know, it's just listed as the freshman history class. One of those basic things that you would understand if you'd gone to college is that every class is labeled as something. Uh, English 105, History 310, Biology 450. Classes are labeled between 101 and 500, and that's supposed to be sort of a difficulty scale, so you can understand how intense the class is going to be. We don't get that, despite saying things like, oh, well, that's just customer service 101 
being a pretty common expression in America. You might as well forget this particular class because I'm not sure it ever really gets mentioned again. There's also a sociology class. I don't think we ever see Tessa attend that, same thing. The only class that actually matters is her British literature class. Although the history class does stand out because that's specifically where she meets her first friend, Landon Gibson. He is also declared an English major. But anyway, Landon and Tessa all both have British literature class together, which is where most of their interactions will take place for the rest of the book. And for some reason, Harden is also in British literature class with the two of them, despite this being an entry-level class and him being a sophomore. It's not impossible, I just wonder why. You would assume that a guy who loves reading, apparently as much as he does, would already be in a more advanced class. And Landon apparently knows Harden, although how he knows him is not revealed yet because the introductory moment is cut off for some reason, and is never brought up for several classes. After class, Landon excuses himself, and Harden comes up to mock Tessa by saying, you would find the lamest kid in class to befriend, and then just being kind of a dick for no apparent reason. And again, for no apparent reason, Tessa looks at Harden and thinks, I try to picture what he would look like without his tattoos and piercings. Even with them, he's very attractive, but his sour personality ruins him. Now, I like that Tessa is actually taking a moment to consider personality because that is something that people should consider uh, in romantic partners, but she is very obsessed with looks, just like her mother is. And if the point of the story was to state, well, you shouldn't judge people on uh, surface level ideas or initial impressions, sometimes there's something deeper and more meaningful about them beneath the surface. That would be a good lesson to have if the book ever considered it. But, like I said before, everyone in this book is terrible. You got You can excuse some of the side characters, and frankly I don't really see anything against Landon specifically, but uh, Tess is terrible, Harden's terrible, Steph is terrible, uh, Nate, Zach, there, there's this other douchebag later on, I want to say like Jacob or something, he's terrible. Everyone is terrible in this book, regardless of appearance. So there's a, there's a much more cynical take on the whole don't judge people by their appearances thing. Just assume they're a piece of shit from the get-go. Harden is the type of loser with low self-confidence who hides it behind a veil of bravado and targets girls with low self-confidence either to feel better about himself or to get them into bed. Real scumbag thus far despite the book's intentions. Learn to notice when people are doing this because you, the people watching this, are worth more than what assholes like Harden would offer you. So two days later on Wednesday, we get uh, Tessa's next uh, British literature class, so we can assume that it is a three-day-a-week class, routine schedule for college classes oftentimes. And the professor, Professor Hill, uh, announces next week's assignment, and this annoys me. Monday, we begin our week-long discussion of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. Tessa is quite ecstatic about this news. I don't hide my excitement, and I'm fairly sure that I let out a squeal. I have read that novel at least 10 times, and it's one of my favorites. Now, the notion of reading Pride and Prejudice in the span of a week astonishes me. There's kind of a joke in college that a lot of the professors don't really consider the workload that students often get. In my junior year, I made the mistake of signing up for three writing classes in at the same time for one semester, and I ended up having to write 45 pages of material within a three-week span, which included a term paper. I barely managed to get it all done in time. It was quite a strain, but it's the kind of workload that professors will sometimes put on students. However, the idea that students would be able to finish Pride and Prejudice within a week doesn't sound possible. Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice is a wonderful story that I recommend everyone read. It has survived as long as it has for good reason. However, the familial connections, the events of the story, are the type where I've seen people come out with flowcharts to explain everything. It's that kind of a tale. On top of that, the writing style is a bit antiquated, so a lot of modern readers won't be able to really just jump into it. The idea that you could finish it, and this is Pride and Prejudice and Sense and Sensibility, so really just consider about half of this, is 
perfectly absurd. One of my favorite classes in college uh, was one where we went over The Inferno by Dante. We spent a month on this book. Not only was that enough time for us to actually go through and study everything, go over the cantos, the characterization, the uh, Greco-Roman mythology, the Christian symbolism, the modern-day implications of what this story led to. This is one of my favorite stories for a reason. I cannot imagine how little we could have actually understood about this book if we had attempted to crunch it down in a single week, especially if we only met three times a week for class. I don't care if Tessa has apparently read this book ten times before. The rest of the students hadn't. The idea that you can just rush that through is so haphazard. It, it defies explanation. And that's not even getting into the analytical portion, because we get a bit of discussion between Hardin and Tessa, and I'm not convinced Todd has ever read Pride and Prejudice. Hardin catches up to Tessa for some reason and just it instigates the conversation with her. Let me guess. You are just madly in love with Mr. Darcy. Every woman who has read the novel is. Now, I conducted a totally scientific and not at all flawed survey on Twitter uh, asking female viewers who have read Pride and Prejudice if they fell in love with Mr. Darcy. And surprise, surprise, a significant portion more stated no. Some giving their reasons for why they did and others why they did not. And that's what I think could spark for a good conversation, a good analytical debate in a literature class. I mean, that right there, did you fall in love with Mr. Darcy, could be an interesting way to explore things through the actions he committed in the book. That is at the heart of pretty much any sort of literature analysis. The connections you take between the characters, their actions, the events of the story, the setting of the piece, how well things are described, information that's left in, that's left out. But the way that these two approach the subject it, it doesn't sound like not only are they incapable of literary analysis, they're incapable of thought. I'm sure you aren't able to comprehend Mr. Darcy's appeal. My mind goes to the massive collection of novels in Hardin's room. They couldn't possibly be his, could they? Whose else would they be? They're in his room, and he's antisocial as hell. No, officer, they're not mine. I'm just holding those books for a friend. A man who is rude and intolerable being made into a romantic hero? It's ridiculous. If Elizabeth had any sense, she would have told him to fuck off from the beginning. Shut the fuck up. Nobody even wants you here. Now, this is one part of where I think Todd is attempting to draw a parallel between Pride and Prejudice and After, because Hardin just described himself, and he is the, somehow, the romantic opposite for uh, for Tessa. And somehow, despite all their prior interactions with Hardin being as obnoxious as he possibly could, Tessa somehow actually enjoys their banter and his presence, which I find weird, considering how often they've butt heads and the fact that she has actually broken down and cried, in part because of him, that she wouldn't want to be anywhere near him. What draws these two together? I couldn't tell you! So you do agree that Elizabeth is an idiot? He raises his eyebrow. Shut the fuck up! No! She is one of the strongest, most complex characters ever written! Now, I don't want to say that the interpretation that Elizabeth Bennet was an idiot is an invalid one, considering how little we get on Hardin's perspective on this. I would say it's not a strong argument, and a lot of it would be tainted by his own personal biases to the point where his interpretation is useless to the discussion at large. It's like trying to argue that The Christmas Carol is a bad story because you hate Christmas. That doesn't matter to the story itself. Why are you bringing that up? But that wasn't even the real analytical scene. There is a class that they had, uh, the scene where the two of them bump heads, and it is... So dreadful. Tessa gets a phone call from Noah, and it's implied that Noah tattled on Tessa, and so now Tessa's mother knows that she went to a party, despite the apparently extensive hour-long discussion warning against them. So he comes off as a little clingy, perhaps possessive, and a more cynical interpretation, a bit controlling. 
but he is still not the worst character here. So the week ends and Steph invites Tessa to another party and at the same frat house and she decides to go because her laptop has apparently bricked itself somehow anyway. So why not? Now she can't watch Netflix. On the day of, Steph says that Molly, uh, the pink haired girl who was making out with Harden, is going to be picking them up and driving them to the, uh, the party. And that, you know, she'll probably stay out of the way. Uh, she's going to be rather occupied tonight. Apparently by Zed because she changes guys every week. And Tessa is confused by this. She thought that because they were making out, she was dating Harden. Turns out that's not the case. No way, Harden doesn't date. He fucks with a lot of girls, but he doesn't date anyone, ever. And considering the testimony we get of some girls later on in the book, we can confirm that Harden does sleep around a lot, thus confirming that Harden is indeed a slut. <laughs> now, one of the more solid pieces of evidence that I have that Todd has never been to college, never been to a frat party, and didn't really research either, is what we get in this particular chapter. Think college party game. I imagine a good number of you just thought of beer pong. It's a popular college game and almost unavoidable at certain parties. You might also have something like a foam party where you take a bunch of suds and uh, unleash them in a basement or on a front lawn. They're actually a lot of fun. And I'm sure a number of you have your own college games that, uh, that you could recall. When Todd thinks of frat party games, apparently she thinks of truth or dare. I suppose you could play truth or dare at a frat party, but I think I would hope most parties would come up with something a little more imaginative than what these people come up with. Tessa goes first, picks truth, and Zed asks if she's a virgin. Despite how much I want to run away and hide, I just nod. Of course I'm a virgin. The furthest Noah and I have gone is making out and some slight groping over our clothes, of course. And unfortunately, that moment is something that's just, the rest of the plot kind of centers around. You can probably imagine what it's leading to, especially if you've seen She's All That. And it just devolves into this impressively juvenile version of the game. Harden gets dared to take his shirt off and keep it off for the entire game. When Tessa finally selects dare, Someone dares her to take a shot of vodka. They then dare her to do the same thing four more times. Guys, are you at least gonna mix it up a little? This is the worst game of truth or dare I've ever come across. Eventually, Molly dares Harden to kiss Tessa, which she refuses, understandable at this point, and that prompts her to leave the game, but still kind of wander around the house. She goes out to the front and calls Noah, talks just enough for him to figure out that she's drunk, and then she hangs up and turns her phone off. She wanders around for a little bit, and eventually, before she can stop herself, finds herself walking back into Harden's room. She takes note of the books. Again, we don't get any titles or authors on any of the shelves, but she comments that Wuthering Heights is missing from where it was on the shelf, but she finds it on the bedside table next to Pride and Prejudice. Harden's comments about the novel replay in my mind. He has obviously read it before and understood it, which is rare for our age group and for a boy especially. Wow, conceited much? Also, considering everything that he's said about it so far, I can promise you he did not understand it. Harden then comes in and demands that Tessa get out of his room. And as she leaves, she asks, why don't you like me? And here we get a little bit more of Harden's perspective of Tessa, as well as uh, her actual backstory when she drunkenly spews it all forth for him. Us? Friends? He laughs and throws up his hands. Isn't it obvious why we can't be friends? Not to me. Well, for starters, you're too uptight. You probably grew up in some perfect little model home that looks like every other block house on the block. Your parents probably bought you everything you ever asked for, and you never had to want for anything. With your stupid pleated skirts, I mean. Honestly, who dresses like that at 18? My mouth falls open. You know nothing about me, you condescending jerk! My life is nothing like that! My alcoholic dad left us when I was 10, and my mother worked her ass off to make sure I could go to college. 
I got my own job as soon as I turned 16 to help with bills, and I happen to like my clothes. Sorry if I don't dress like a slut like all the girls around you. For someone who tries too hard to stand out and be different, you sure are judgmental about people who are different from you. I scream and feel the tears well up in my eyes. Okay, so quite a bit uh, to break down with that. Similar to what Tessa did earlier in the book, Hardin will judge people on uh, initial glances and supposition, only he goes a little bit further because Tessa at least gave people a chance to be nice and to prove her wrong, and then she tries to be nice back to them. Hardin never even made that much of an attempt. He just assumed the worst in people because he himself is a pretty bad person. Tessa's backstory, on the other hand, is fine, except she doesn't really seem to... Like, she seems almost completely divorced from it in this story. She said she's had a job before, but it doesn't feel like that. Uh, she said that her mother worked her ass off to make sure she could go to college, but it doesn't feel like that. There's potentially some impact from her father leaving when she was younger because it's later used to sympathize with Harden. I'm assuming that it's something that comes up much later in the series as some sort of a surprise twist. Oh my god, dad, what are you doing here? I haven't seen you in eight years! When you go for a sudden reveal like this, like, that's not what my life was like at all, it should leave some degree of explanation. It should have you, as the reader, saying, oh, that makes sense all of a sudden. You've got to play with intrigue a little bit. Leave some breadcrumbs. And when you finally do give the answer, it should come as something of a, uh, a relief or a burst of understanding. Of course that's why she acted that naive during college. She's an alien from 500 years in the future. She has no grounds for human understanding or society. Despite the initial plan to leave the party by midnight. It's actually uh, well after three by this point in the story. So late that the buses have stopped uh, driving around. So much for all that great planning Tessa does, huh? She starts tearing up and Harden, mostly to get her to be quiet, just starts talking about something else. It, she says she needs water. He um, offers her a drink and says that, you know, it's water. He doesn't drink, which we later learn is a tremendous lie, so I guess he can add a few inches for Harden there. Bet he could use a few inches. Beautiful and sophisticated. Like a baby's finger holding a blueberry. Hmm. And as part of the conversation, Tessa reveals that after college she wants to be an author or a publisher, uh, whichever comes first. Keep this in mind, I'll be coming back to it later. Since she doesn't have a way home, Tessa is allowed to crash in one of the beds at the frat house, and uh, there is another drunk creep in there, and I'm going to spare some details, but he tries making the moves on Tessa, insisting they're going to have some fun. Now the correct response would be to set this guy on fire, but Tessa runs down the hall and pounds on Harden's door, begging to come back, uh, begging to come inside, and in the first decent thing he's done in the book, uh, he actually allows her in. But again, this doesn't count as a good quality because this is bare minimum stuff. And despite the harrowing situation she almost found herself in and the fact that Tessa uh, breaks down and cries in front of Harden once she gets inside of his room, he comments that he didn't notice how gray her eyes are and then she crashes her face into his. And he kisses back and it's totally romantic, I guess. Harden's mouth tastes just like I had imagined. I can taste the faint hint of mint on his tongue as he opens his mouth and kisses me. Really kisses me. His warm tongue runs, runs along mine, and I can feel the cold metal of his lip ring on the corner of my mouth. And she's enjoying this makeout session until she remembers she has a boyfriend and shouldn't be doing this. So she backs away, and in a moment to make it look like he's not hurt, Harden says, It was just a kiss. People kiss all the time. So this demonstrates that Harden doesn't really see any value in romantic gestures, or potentially even in other people. And this does do a good job of making me wonder what is his backstory, but the backstory we get in this book isn't enough to really explain how damaged he is. Doesn't really make a lot of sense when we get to it, but we will get to it. But because she doesn't want word of this event going back to Noah, Tessa asks 
Harden not to tell anyone about it, and he responds thusly, Trust me, I don't want anyone to know about this either. Now stop talking about it, he snaps. And there's his arrogance again. So now you're back to your old self, I see. I never was anyone else. Don't think because you kissed me, basically against my will, we have some sort of bond now. So the thing about Harden is that he puts up this front that he doesn't care, he's, you know, uh, doesn't need anyone, it's just him against the world, he doesn't have any real connections, doesn't see kissing as any kind of an intimate reaction. Harden is the type of wannabe badass who insists that he's above feelings and is actually so vulnerable that he just cuts himself off from other people. It's not that he doesn't have feelings, it's that he masks them so heavily that he doesn't want other people to see how weak he potentially is. I am the king! I will punish you. Any man who must say I am the king is no true king. Classic wannabe alpha guy syndrome, it's not really impressive. It's understandable at this point in time, high school and college, you get a lot of people like that. It doesn't look good though. And rather than wait for a ride home, Tessa decides to walk back to her dorm, at which point she checks her phone and notices that she has a whole bunch of text messages from Noah and her mother. And while she is initially upset with Noah, she realizes to herself that she doesn't have the right. But I can't even be upset with him. I just cheated on him. What would give me the right? So in her own words, with her own logic, Tessa considers what she just did cheating. Keep that in mind, we'll be coming back to it! How many times am I going to say that in this review? While she's walking back, and this is the hour and a half long walk that I'd mentioned before, Tessa wonders why is Harden, a wannabe uh, punk kid, in a frat with a bunch of preppy kids? I didn't even realize up to this point that they were preppy kids because again we've gotten no real description. Frat doesn't mean rich or good, Case in point, Animal House. So this guy is a total loser? Well, let me tell you the story of another loser. <laughs> but because it's so late in the morning, Tessa decides to go out, get some coffee, and hopefully start her day. It's apparently the weekend, so I don't know why she can't just crash for a few hours, but whatever. But when she gets back to her dorm, Harden is waiting for her. He claims that he drove around looking for her for two hours, which makes me wonder how convoluted are the streets if he couldn't find her for two hours. Tessa even used a GPS, probably finding the most direct route back to her dorm. So how did Harden miss her? But they don't get much of a conversation in because just then there's some knocking, and it's Tessa's mother at six in the morning, and she's not alone. Noah is there too. Now, I can totally understand why Tessa's mother, considering everything we've known about her up to this point, why she would drive two hours in the middle of the night to check on her baby girl. It also really doesn't strike at a lot of confidence of Teresa's ability or preparation for college if she's been here for a week and... Tessa's mother is already driving in to check in on her. But I also have to question the wisdom of bringing Noah, a 17-year-old, a minor, away from his home at four in the morning. I don't think this is entirely legal. Are Noah's parents okay with this? Are they aware of where he is at this moment? That's not a kidnapping, it's a surprise adoption. We've already had a moment where Teresa's mom said she considers Noah like a son. Although I will say, in the book's defense, we do get this good line that suggests that Tessa has always had some degree of resentment towards her mother. So this is why you haven't been answering your phone? Because you have this, this, she waves her arms around in his direction, tattooed troublemaker in your room at 6 a.m.? My blood boils. I am usually timid and sort of afraid when it comes to her. She has never hit me or anything, but she isn't shy when it comes to pointing out my mistakes. You aren't wearing that, are you, Tessa? You should have brushed your hair again, Tessa. I think you should have done better than that on your tests, Tessa. There's a lengthy lecture uh, as Tessa's mom just goes off on her for a while, and it results with her mother calming down and agreeing that she, Noah, and Tessa are gonna go into town for a little bit and just continue their talk. And as they're leaving, Noah says that he really doesn't like Harden. Relatable. Me either, I whisper. But I know I'm lying. 
So Tessa's mom takes Tessa and Noah out to the Benton Mall, which as far as I can tell is not a real place. And Noah, out of nowhere, asks if Tessa has uh, figured out a place she wants to work. She says a bookstore, maybe, or maybe she could find an internship or something related to publishing or writing. You know, for someone who claims that she's into writing and wants to be an author one day, we never see Tessa actually writing anything. Like so many other things that I could cite, this feels like Todd is just putting herself in Tessa's position, cementing the idea that Tessa is just a self-insert character and nothing beyond that. But during the visit to the mall, Tessa decides that she, in a moment of guilt, uh, tries to kiss Noah. And when she does that, he pulls back, claiming that everyone's staring at them. And she pretty much has to beg in order to get anything out of him. He must see the desperation in my eyes because he tilts my chin up and kisses me. It's gentle and slow, no urgency behind it. His tongue barely touches mine, but it's nice, familiar and warm. I wait for a fire to ignite within me, but it doesn't. So this scene is one of the few things that I would almost say that Todd does well because she sprinkles in these little hints that Tessa is waking up to who she really wants to be now that she's no longer under the uh, beck and call of her mother or her mother's demands. And she can pull away from Noah because he's safe but kind of boring. Harden, however, is new and exciting. And that isn't a bad idea for a story in and of itself, but as we will see, there are some steps that they skip along the way. Kind of essential steps. And as a result, Tessa becomes a vastly worse person. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Noah picks up on Tessa's unusual behavior and she just says, I just missed you and doesn't really reveal that she actually made out with Harden, and asks that he stop telling her mother when she does things. And he makes the promise saying that he'll stop. Tuck wanted to come say hi. Tuck. Tuck. I was working on the pictures and he kept sticking his nose against the door. Really? Tuck. Yeah. Come on, buddy. Daddy. He's right Here, buddy. There. What are, you, what are you doing? Okay. If you just want attention, you are on my card. <laughs> Come here. You giant baby. <laughs> yes, you're big and ferocious. This is now an episode of The Bark Was Better. Uh, now to understand why uh, Homeward Bound was actually the grandest Greco-Roman epic of all time with shit i can't think of anything okay so you're gonna want to see this we don't understand why he does this i'm not really grabbing him i'm not touching him and hi tuck hey daddy so for some reason whenever i use baby talk around him and, and i'm the only one who can make him do this i got you you're, you're fine i'm the only one who can make him do this Whenever I use baby talk around Tuck, it really annoys him. So if I start talking like this, he starts grumbling away the bit. Yes, he does. I don't know why he doesn't like this. It's kind of weird. He just starts grumbling. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. And I'm not pinching him or anything. He's just doing this. It's the weirdest thing. Yes, he is. If I do this long enough, he eventually starts barking. All right, I got to get back to work. Yes, 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 yes. Wriggle puppy. Go on. <laughs> you just wanted a dog cameo in my video. Go. This entire book feels like a second draft. Todd went through to check grammar and syntax, but not her scenes. Certain elements contradict with elements from prior chapters, or moments don't get enough description. This is the start of a book, but it is not a finished book. The next day, Tessa and Landon go to British literature class, and you wouldn't believe this, guys, but I think Tessa might like Pride and Prejudice. We dive into Pride and Prejudice, a magical book that I wish everyone would read, and before I realize it, the class is over. So we get an idea that she does like the book, but I couldn't tell you why. Aside from, like, some vague notion that, like, she loves Mr. Darcy or something. There's no depth or understanding, and written the way that it is, especially with the uh, add-in, a magical book that I wish everyone would read, it sounds more like Todd likes Pride and Prejudice, doesn't fully understand why, 
and is trying to push the idea onto her readers and get them to read it. Granted, that's a good goal. More people should read Pride and Prejudice. I recommend it, but that doesn't fit itself into a story when you just jam it in there, especially when you don't give it any detail. But after class, Landon finally reveals that Hardin's dad is sort of dating his mom. So Landon and Hardin are sort of stepbrothers. Hey, I never asked you. Yeah. You like guacamole? <laughs> ah! <laughs> and then that scene just goes to nothing while Tessa goes back to her dorm and considers her relationship with Noah pretty much assessing it the way that I did just a minute ago. Noah was the safe option who was always there for Tessa, especially after her father left. He just doesn't excite her. And here's a rattling at the door, and it turns out it's Harden, and that's when we learn that Steph gave him an extra key as backup for herself. So the fact that Steph apparently did that without ever notifying Tessa is a massive red flag, but you can see why I have so many of those around here now. And Tessa was going to take a nap and then try to get to some studying in, but Hardin decides to just walk in and harass her. He grabs her literature notes and scatters it about. And when she demands that he pick them up, he grabs her sociology notes and scatters those about. And Hardin tries to justify this by saying, you mean someone doesn't like their stuff being messed with? I can see there, in his mind, a, a parallel between her coming into his room twice and touching his books, the problem being she didn't make a mess that he, uh, she left him to clean up. Like, he is going out of his way to antagonize her, and I don't know why. Like, the whole... I, I can't even call it a macho shtick. Just being a dick, going out of your way to be a dick, is so weird and so unattractive that I have to wonder if... Anna Todd herself is okay. Is her relationship with her husband normal? And I, granted, that's none of my business, but if this is what she finds attractive, oh boy, do I have questions. For some inexplicable reason, this turns into a makeout session. You mean someone doesn't like their stuff being messed with? He asks, still laughing. Why must he always laugh at me? No, I don't, I yell and go to shove him again. He steps toward me and grabs my wrists, pushing me back against the wall. His face is inches from mine, and suddenly I'm aware I'm breathing way too hard. I want to scream at him to get off me, to let me go, and demand that he put my work back. I want to slap him to make him leave, but I can't. And then they start making out for no discernible reason. And this is one of those moments where I think in the right context, you can make it work, you can make it romantic, but that context hasn't been provided in this book. In 365 Days, for example, there was an obvious power dynamic that was at play between the protagonist and the love interest. We were always aware of that. Just by nature of the genre itself, the power dynamic was always going to be at play. Whether or not it works is a matter of interpretation. I would say it doesn't in that book, but the concept of a power dynamic in and of itself could still have some validity if it's handled correctly. This is not handled correctly. This is a douchebag coming in, messing with a girl that he's messed with multiple times before, and then just kind of forcing himself on her. I will leave it to any of the women in my audience, or you know what, I'm gonna extend it beyond that. Any of the gay dudes or bi dudes in my audience who might be potentially attracted to this, if you could explain what the hell is going on, because I certainly can't. Being evil just makes you hotter. As Moon said, we don't make the rules. We abide by them. And Tessa just gets completely lost in the moment and, and allows her instincts to override her better judgment. The responsible voice inside my head finds her way in, reminding me that this is a terrible idea, but I push her back. I am not stopping this time. I pull Harden's hair harder, earning a moan from him. We get a detailed makeout session between Harden and Tessa. While I can't always describe why a couple is attracted to each other, especially at this age when looks are such a big part of attraction, I can't find anything other than looks alone to bring these two together. Besides, Harden just trashed Tessa's room and her reaction is to vigorously make out with him. This wouldn't be so bad if not with the added bonus of cheating on Noah, who doesn't serve any real point in the story except to act as a visual aid of what Tessa's old life was like. By extension, this also makes her look awful since there's otherwise unnecessary baggage of her old relationship. Was her life so dull that simply dipping her toes into college life was enough exposure that she radically changed who, she, who and what she was? She's been there a week and she's already moved on to another guy. 
Hormones and new experiences can get people to do radical things, but this all works together to make Tessa look like a terrible, confused mess. And I cannot say for certain that that terrible, confused mess is entirely what the author was going for. Certainly to a point, there's something that she must have been aware of that Tessa came across as, but not to the extent that she does. Tessa is a terrible person, especially when you consider that she is actively fighting against her common sense. The reasonable part of Tessa's brain tells her that kissing Harden is a bad idea, and she specifically says she's pushing that part of her brain away. So she's not reacting on hormones or instincts, she's now putting active effort into kissing Harden, aka cheating on Noah, and that's by her own metrics too. What even are personal standards? Now they go a little beyond making out where Harden eventually gets Tessa's shirt off and she starts dry humping him on the bed. And this could work towards a bit of romantic chemistry where the two are teasing each other back and forth and you draw that out for the sake of the reader to uh, make them want more, to anticipate more because you're showing that you're willing to take a little bit further each time. Except for the fact that these two are terrible, deplorable people. Well, the scene could have gone on further, except Steph walks in and interrupts the two of them. Steph laughs at the idea of Harden and Tessa um, hooking up, and Tessa tries to shrug it off, like, eh, we aren't messing around, I have a boyfriend, remember? And Steph says, so? That doesn't mean you can't mess around with Harden, confirming that she is also a terrible person. Steph then opens up a little bit and admits that she and Harden used to have a fling together the previous year, but I'm a little confused by the way she describes it. Well, I haven't had sex with him, but we had a little fling when we first met, as embarrassing as that is to admit, but nothing came from it. We were sort of friends with benefits for about a week. So you were friends with benefits but you weren't having sex. What were the benefits? Were you buying each other coffee? I mean, Steph just tries to list it as heavy makeout sessions and a grope here or there, nothing serious, but friends with benefits is nothing serious in the first place. Does Todd know what that means? Or do people actually use it to mean that? Finally, we get to chapter 23, which is the one that I've been looking forward to talking about because this is where Todd attempts or pretends to analyze Pride and Prejudice, and she does such a bad job at it that if I were the professor in this class, I would have kicked her out for incompetence. It starts off by saying it took her almost an hour to get her notes in order after Harden's annoying stunt, which is confusing because she's been in college for two weeks. How does she have so many notes that it takes an hour to get them in order? We had only two classes of notes that got scattered about. It should have taken her a minute or two to get that all put together again. Frankly, it should all be inside of a spiral notebook or something. It's college. They don't really rely on a lot of handouts. It depends on the notes you take in class. So Professor Hill starts off by saying, today will be our last day on Pride and Prejudice. I hope you all enjoyed it. And since you've all read the ending, it feels fitting to base to say, uh, today's discussion on Austin's use of foreshadowing. So I wasn't exaggerating when I said the professor expects them all to read Pride and Prejudice within the span of a week. Unless the professor has them skipping around through only a handful of chapters, at which point he's doing the book a terrible disservice. Some books you cannot skip around. Look, if you were to skip around in the Inferno, I could understand that because some circles you can focus on better than others. You can't just skip around in a few chapters in Pride and Prejudice. You would lose so much meaning in the book. It's not something you can just like sporadically comb through and get a general gist of the book like Ulysses by James Joyce or Finnegan's Wake by James Joyce or Emergency Kindling by James Joyce. James Joyce is the most overrated writer in English history. Anyway, for some reason, the professor wants to talk on the use of foreshadowing, which is like... I mean, you can talk about foreshadowing in Pride and Prejudice, but that's not one of the stronger elements, so... Why focus on that and not interpersonal connections or uh, the culture of the time or the viewpoints of society? So, very quick recap of Pride and Prejudice, and I'm not going to be able to do this, the story justice, so... Do read it for yourself. You got Mr. Darcy on one side, you got Elizabeth Bennet on the other side. They meet at a party. Mr. Darcy is a bit withdrawn. You can argue that he was rude and they go off not really liking each other. Well, through various circumstances, they keep running into each other. Turns out that Mr. Darcy has made some 
presumptuous moves, but still finds himself attracted to Elizabeth. Elizabeth turns him down because of the particular moves that he's made, one specifically which actually impacts her uh, sister's future romantically, but Mr. Darcy takes steps to uh, fix the damage that he's caused and improve things for Elizabeth as a result. And a whole lot of other stuff happens, but that's the baseline of what you need to understand for this next part of the book. So, the professor asks, It feels fitting to base today's discussion on Austin's use of foreshadowing. Let me ask, as a reader, did you expect her and Darcy to become a couple by the end? And let's ignore for the moment that the her in this context could only refer to Austin herself because Elizabeth's name is not mentioned yet. And some students apparently flip through their books at random looking for an answer, and I can't blame them because how the hell can they absorb any of the information within a week? But since she has read it so many times, you would figure that Tessa would have an articulate and detailed explanation for this answer. You'd be wrong. Well, the first time I read the novel, I was on the edge of my seat about whether or not they would end up together. Even now, and I have read it at least ten times, I still feel anxious during the beginning of the relationship. Mr. Darcy is so cruel and says such hateful things about Elizabeth and her family that I never know if, if she can forgive him, let alone love him. Landon nods at my answer and I smile. That doesn't answer the question. That has nothing to do with the concept of foreshadowing. It has nothing to do with anything. That is a momentary personal opinion about the end result of the book. She didn't answer the question. Why is Landon nodding? Harden appropriately but rudely uh, calls out that that's a load and the professor calls on him in order to respond. Sure, I said that's a load. Women want what they can't have. Mr. Darcy's rude attitude is what drew Elizabeth to him so it was obvious they would wind up together. Harden argues that Tessa's interpretation of Mr. Darcy and Elizabeth is wrong because women want what they can't have. This is a shallow observation, and it doesn't seem to draw anything from the story. If he can cite something, he can discuss it, but he seems to be pulling this out of his ass. Also, how does that comment not get him booed out of class by all the women in the room? I think it's fair to say that the conversation slowly morphs and gets derailed, so it goes from a discussion, discussion about pride and prejudice and more towards the relationship that Hardin and Tessa have. This is one of the ways that Todd attempts to uh, draw parallels between Pride and Prejudice and her book. And she doesn't do a very good job at it. Now, Tessa responds, somewhat outraged by Hardin's comment, understandable, arrogant prick that he is. That isn't true about women wanting what they can't have. Mr. Darcy was only mean to her because he was too proud to admit he loved her. Once he stopped his hateful act, she saw that he really loved her. And this right here is why I think that Todd either never read Pride and Prejudice or never really analyzed it in any way and is thoroughly unprepared for this entire conversation. See, here's the central issue with Tessa's entire argument. She claims that Mr. Darcy was too proud to admit that he loved Elizabeth, even though by the half-ish way point he does. The core issue between Mr. Darcy and Elizabeth wasn't that Mr. Darcy was too proud, it's that Elizabeth's family was in his eyes too poor and so he was prejudiced against her. And knowing this, Elizabeth rejected him because she wasn't just going to roll over and let some guy who has been cruel to her family this entire time just have what he wants because she was too proud! Hey, you get it? This is the title and the point of the whole story! If you don't even understand the meaning of the title, why are you talking about the book as a whole? If Todd really wanted to discuss deeper themes or critical analysis, what she should have done is focus on how Elizabeth's independence made her a feminist icon because of her refusal to fall in line with how women of her time were expected to fall in line with society. That is how you do deep, critical literary analysis. Stay out of my lane, Todd! God, I'm a dork. The discussion really just doesn't go anywhere from that. It just Harden and Tessa go back and forth for a little bit, and it, I have no idea why the professor allows this at all, because they're clearly not talking about Pride and Prejudice. Harden exhales. 
I don't know what kind of guys you normally go for, but I think if he loved her, he wouldn't have been mean to her. The only reason he even ended up asking for her hand in marriage was because she wouldn't stop throwing herself at him, he says with emphasis, and my heart drops. But finally, we're getting at what he's really thinking. She did not throw herself at him. He manipulated her into thinking he was kind and took advantage of her weakness. I scream, and then the room really, truly goes silent. Harden's face is flushed with anger, and I can't imagine mine looks much different. He manipulated her? Try again. She is... I mean, she was so bored with her boring life that she had to find excitement somewhere, so she certainly was throwing herself at him. He yells back, his hand gripping the desk. Well, maybe if he wasn't such a man whore, he could have stopped it after the first time instead of showing up to her room. The professor finally cuts in, entirely too late in my opinion, and I would have loved it if they had continued and tried to answer another ridiculous question, but... That was all the uh, energy Todd had to pretend that she could break down a classic story, so Tessa grabs her stuff and runs out of the classroom. Harden goes after her for some reason, and they have a confrontation out in the hall where Tessa asks, you know, what the hell is wrong with him? One second you're nice, then you're hateful. Personal interpretation of a story can lead to some interesting discussion. Uh, if there is a particular element of a book or an author or a time period or a subject that the book covers that you can uh, add in, then it can make things more interesting or lively in a classroom discussion. I've had plenty of uh, literary discussions in college classes where other students had some nugget of information about a particular time period or a uh, certain profession that they were able to add in and uh, we broke down its utilization in a certain story. Uh, when we were going over the Inferno, I used to bring up Bible quotes in order to break down particular sections, maybe help understand the punishments of certain circles a little better. And sometimes you can get things wrong, so having a, a lively discussion in a classroom can be a wonderful opportunity to uh, expand your understanding of a text or challenge your preconceived notions or maybe there's something you overlooked. That's largely what I do for these videos. It's just literary analysis based on my own interpretation of what goes on within the story, regardless of what the author might have been going for. I try to mention that every once in a while, like how Todd seems to think that this is a romantic book, and I call it an abject disaster. Aye. This one over here is called This Is Not a Boating Accident. Outside of the classroom, Harden tries to break down how Tessa must really feel and insists that She's bored with Noah. And this is one of the scenes that, if you look back at, considering the ending of the book, looks incredibly manipulative. It must be exhausting. What? What must be exhausting? Acting like you don't want me, when we both know you do, he says and steps closer. What? I do not want you. I have a boyfriend. The words tumble out too fast and reveal their absurdity, making him smile. A boyfriend that you're bored with. Admit it, Tess. Not to me, but to yourself. You're bored with him. His voice lowers and slows to a sensual pace. Has he ever made you feel the way I do? What? Of course he has, I lie. No, he hasn't. I can tell you've never been touched. Really touched. Harden's touched. And Harden tries to seduce Tessa a little bit, and she's not quite sure how to take it. It's strange to crave and hate someone at the same time. Well, unless you're a vampire who wants to drink his worst enemy. <laughs> you're wrong, I mutter, and he smiles, and even that sends electricity through me. I'm never wrong, he says. Not about this. Well, if your interpretation of Pride and Prejudice is anything to go by, you're wrong about a lot of things. Eventually, Harden extends something of an olive branch when he says that he doesn't think they can stay away from each other, Steph being one of his best friends after all. They're just going to keep running into each other, so it might be best if they try to be friends. And Tessa thinks that she can't keep kissing Harden and cheating on Noah, so she reluctantly agrees to be friends with him. So, will you try to be nicer to me? Sure. Will you try not to be so uptight and bitchy all the time? Man, this is off to a great start. As part of their newfound friendship, Harden suggests that they do something fun tomorrow after class. Which is weird, because I thought it was Friday, because they spent a week reading Pride and Prejudice, but... Oh well, inconsistency within the plot is not impossible in this book. After class, Landon uh, warns Tessa to be careful with Harden, because he's 
kind of a dick. Harden tells him to get lost, man. And Tessa says, hey, you don't have to be cruel to him. You guys are practically brothers. Then she reveals that she actually knows that Harden's dad and Landon's mom are dating and Harden explodes. You leave him alone, Harden. He didn't even want to tell me, but I got it out of him. The idea of Harden hurting Landon makes me sick. I need to change the subject. So, where are we going today? I ask, and he glares at me. We aren't going anywhere! This was a bad idea! And then he leaves. So... So much for that friendship! Elmo's not going to play with Zoe anymore! This play night is over! So Tessa goes back to her room where Steph is hanging out with Zed and some other guy named Tristan. And then Harden walks in and just announces that he and Tessa have plans. Like, this degree of inconsistency should be setting off alarm bells in Tessa's mind. He is so unpredictable at this point, and she doesn't even know where they're going. She should refuse, but she just slips off of Steph's bed and follows Harden out to his car. He is just such a dick the entire time. It is really uncomfortable to read about, and I just, I want to feel sorry for Tessa, but... The red flags are there, and she's an idiot for not seeing it. You just got done telling me that you didn't want to hang out with me. Yes, I did. Now get in the car. If you don't admit that you didn't come here to see me, I will go back in there and go to the movies with Zed. Admit it, Harden, or I'm gone. Okay, fine. I admit it. Now get in the damn car. I won't ask again. And once they're inside, don't touch my radio. During the drive, Tessa says that Harden's music choice is terrible. Whatever it is, we don't know naturally. And Harden, in a weirdly out-of-character moment, asks Tessa what her opinion on good music is, and she says, Bon Iver and The Fray. Not bad music. And she says it's because they're insanely talented and their music is wonderful, so that's probably the most analytical that Todd gets in the entire book. At least it's some detail. Then again, I can't really judge other people for their music. My music choice is best described as colorful noise. Pendulum, Cell Dweller, Andrew WK, Breaking Benjamin is probably the closest to mainstream I like. Well, they're driving off somewhere. Tessa doesn't really know, so she asks, where are they going? To one of my favorite places. Which is where? You really have to know everything that's going on in advance, don't you? Yeah, I like to control everything. I stay quiet. I know he's right, but that's just the way I am. Okay, this is a really terrible lesson to take. Don't get in a weird guy's car if you don't know where you're going. This is so alarming, especially one as violently unpredictable as Harden. And the red flag is they just keep flying because it turns out that where they're going to is a park. Specifically, it's a place with a river in the back and they're going to go swimming, something that you'd think you'd want to know about beforehand. And Tessa figures out that Harden just dragged her here so that he could get her clothes off and she doesn't leave. Now, I grew up in the kind of environment where it was entirely normal to just go to some random ass stream and go swimming in it. But that was a thing that you did with your guy friends. You didn't try tricking women into doing that. Have some fucking class. Well, with enough harassment by saying that she's boring and she's no fun and she's missing out, through harassment, coercion, and eventually bargaining, Harden convinces Tessa to strip down to her underwear if he gives her his shirt to wear as kind of, I guess, a swimsuit, and offers to reveal one big secret about himself if uh, if she just takes off her clothes and jumps in the water, which saying out loud is such a scummy thing, why would you ever write that? But eventually Tessa strips down, puts on Harden's shirt, and jumps into the water, though she apparently can't swim too terribly well. The question that she eventually asks Harden is, who do you love most in the world? To which Harden answers himself, understandable considering how self-centered he's been up to this point, and she tries probing a little bit by asking, what about your parents? His face twists and his eyes lose the softness I was becoming fond of. Do not speak of my parents again, got it? He snaps, and I want to smack myself for ruining the good time we were having. Again, red flags galore, but the scene 
pretends to morph itself into this really uncomfortable going along with it because that's what the plot demands moment where Harden just kind of grabs Tessa and she flails around as they're messing about in the water and just he tries the most god-awful cliched romantic pickup lines it's so bad what are you doing to me tess he says softly and rubs his thumb over my bottom lip i don't know i answer truthfully into his thumb which still traces over my mouth these lips the things you could do with them do you want me to stop? We can't just be friends. You know that, don't you? Seriously, Harden is so unpredictable that I'm not sure how anyone could feel safe around him. Tessa should be walking around with a Glock trained on him at all times. And then do the readers a favor and shoot him anyway. Oops. Sorry. My fingers slipped. So it's not that Harden and Tessa are like water and oil. It's more like they're water and sodium metal. So Harden continues more manipulative nonsense and just tries to turn Tessa on. It eventually works, and it's just... Car <clears throat> this is so frustrating. From where he stands, he dips down a little to meet my eyes. Do you want it to be here, or my room? I shrug nervously. I don't want to go to his room, because it's too far. The drive will give me too much time to overthink what I am about to do. Here, I say, and look around. There is no one in sight, and I pray no one will come here. Tessa is fully aware of what's going on, is fully aware of what she's about to do, and she's about to cheat on Noah knowingly again. I hate this. Tessa thinks that they're about to have sex, but Harden confirms that he's not going to have sex with her yet. Instead, he takes her to the riverside, and they... Bang, bang, bang. Bang, bang, bang. Why does my audience want me reading low-grade porn? Tessa also reveals that she doesn't... explore herself. So, this is the first time she arrived, as it were. I've never been so off-put by a story attempting to be erotic. This book is now porn. I did not see this coming, and I'm not sure how to really judge it. Feels lazy, like the sex scenes are just being added to compensate for a lack of characters or real drama. Harden then pulls out a cell phone from his pocket and starts playing around with the screen. My suspicion at the time was that he was either texting somebody confirming that he had gotten to third base with Tessa or was taking pictures or something. I'm not sure that it ever got confirmed later on. And eventually they leave without really a word, and they just go off and get dinner. My feelings for Harden are so confusing. I hate him one minute and want to kiss him the next. He makes me feel things I never knew I could, and not just sexually. He makes me laugh and cry, yell and scream, but most of all, he makes me feel alive. Alive. It's alive. It's alive. I refuse to take this book seriously. They pop into some little hole in the wall, I guess. Uh, along the way, Tessa reveals that she wants to work in publishing at some point, and Harden reveals that he knows someone over at Vance Publishing House, and maybe he could give him a call. They get some food, apparently it's good, then Harden drives Tessa back to her dorm, and they start making out when Noah calls her, and she just ignores him. I lean back to continue kissing Harden, but he stops me. I think I better go. His tone is clipped and sends worry through me. And Tessa decides that the way she feels about Harden is another reason she can't be with Noah. She loves Noah, but if she really loved him the way he deserves to be loved, I wouldn't be having these feelings for Harden. And she wants to break up with him and uh, makes, a, makes the offer to leave Noah for Harden. Harden, I ignored it. I'm going to talk to him about all this. I just don't know how or when, but it will be soon though, I promise. Talk to him about what? He snaps. All of this, I wave my hands around. Us. Us? You're not you're not telling me you're going to break up with him for me, are you? Looking back at it, considering the end of the book, this particular moment is rather confusing to me because I 
cannot actually tell you what Hardin's overall plan is here. I am convinced that the ending of the book was written kind of suddenly and with no prior planning, really, because Hardin could have very easily made a move and gotten in a relationship with Tessa, and that would have just made a lot of things easier for him later on, but I am getting ahead of myself. Keep this moment in mind, we're not done with it yet. So Hardin kind of laughs off the whole idea and reiterates that he doesn't date anybody. And Tessa realizes that he has been using her and she gets angry with him. Understandable. You're disgusting, I say bitterly and grab my stealth from the floorboards and my phone from the seat. Hardin looks like he wants to say something but doesn't. Stay away from me from now on. I mean it, I shout and he closes his eyes. She runs into her dorm and breaks down, realizing that she just cheated on Noah again and all for nothing. But it was all an act just so he could get into my pants and I let him. Later on, Steph shows up and asks how the hangout with Harden went and Tessa just says he was his normal charming self and Steph tries to give her a warning saying, be careful, you're too nice for someone like him. And it looks like Steph might be going out with Tristan now because apparently they had a fun time at the uh, movie and it makes Tessa reflect on how Harden treats her. But I remind myself that I do have someone who loves me and that I need to start treating him better and stay away from Harden for real this time. Guess how long that lasts. The next morning, Tessa feels drained, so she goes and borrows some of Steph's makeup, uh, specifically some brown eyeliner, and draws a thin line under her eyes, which I have been told is very unhygienic. A lesson that even Model Land went out of its way to point out, and I would hold up my copy of Model Land, but I can't seem to find it right now. Harden makes an effort to talk to Tessa in their literature class together, and she just rebuffs him. Between her guilt and apparently 10 people asking if she's going to be at the frat party that weekend, she decides that she needs to talk to Noah. And so, even though it is a bit of a hassle, she asks, Hey, do you think you could come visit me? I ask. Sure, yeah. Maybe I can come next weekend? I groan. No, I mean like today. Like now. Could you leave right now? I know he likes to plan things just like I do, but I need him to come now. Tessa, I have practice after school. I'm still at school now, just at lunch, he explains. Please, Noah, I really miss you. Can't you just leave now and come here for the weekend, please? I know I'm begging, but I don't care. And Noah agrees to come visit uh, after school, so he'll be there by the evening. Tessa also makes it a point to mention that Noah is arriving and does it in such a way that Harden overhears it when she's talking to Landon. So Noah shows up and he and Tessa make plans to watch Netflix and hang out in her dorm room for a little while, when all of a sudden Harden just barges in which is another reason why he really shouldn't have a key to her dorm room. He claims that he's meeting Steph. I doubt that very much because she's out with Tristan. So that's clearly a lie. He tries antagonizing Tessa and Noah before leaving and then he just fucks off. So Tessa attempts to turn Netflix into Netflix and chill, but Noah is steadfast in the belief that they should wait until after marriage. So even though he responds uh, during their makeout session, he's not going to act on it. And in order to avoid further temptation, he's actually booked a, a, a hotel somewhere in town. So he's not gonna be crashing at uh, Tessa's dorm for the night. Tessa and Noah spend the day together. They drive out to the park. Uh, Noah asks when she's gonna start looking for a car. and. Uh, she thinks sometime this week. She just needs to start applying for jobs. And when they're in the park, we get another comparative scene between Hardin's impetuousness and Noah's reluctance to step out of his comfort zone. Do you want to swim? I ask, not quite sure why I pushed this moment further. In there? No way, he says, laughing. And as I deflate a little, I mentally smack myself. I need to stop comparing Noah to Hardin. I was just joking, I lie. Later that evening, Noah and Tessa are hanging out in her dorm again when she gets a panic call from Landon. See, he lives with his mom and Hardin's dad off campus. Apparently Hardin came by 
And, well, something happened we don't know yet. You don't know yet! Landon asks if Tessa can, if he gives her an address, if she can come over and help out with something. And in the start of one of the most fucked up moments of the book, and that's saying something, Tessa borrows Noah's car, but leaves him behind. Apparently, she needs to go alone. I don't know why she got that idea. I don't know why she's even responding, considering everything, but whatever. The problem is, if Noah did go along with Tessa, the rest of the plot wouldn't be able to happen, and we can't let something like character get in the way of the plot, now can we? So Tessa takes Noah's car and drives alone to go see Harden at Landon's request. And while she is still internally conflicted as to what's really going on, she doesn't really do herself any favors by pointing this out. I'm just as confused when I arrive at the address as when I left my room. Noah has called twice, both of which I've ignored. I need the navigation to stay on the screen, and honestly, the confused look on his face when I left him there is haunting me. Does anyone want to try defending this character? Tessa is haunted by the confused look on Noah's face when she left him, took his car, and is driving somewhere she's never been in order to help someone she doesn't like. Yeah, I'd be confused too! So something I forgot to mention, while she was on the phone with Landon, she heard crashing in the background. So when she gets up, Landon explains what's going on. I know you hate him, but you do talk to him. He's really drunk, completely belligerent. He showed up here and opened a bottle of his father's scotch. He drank over half the bottle. And then he started breaking things. All my mother's dishes, a glass cabinet, basically everything he could get his hands on. And what caused this violent temper tantrum? What horrible news did he receive? What is he reacting to? Is it possibly seeing Noah and Tessa happy in her dorm? You might think that, and he'd be wrong. His dad just told him that he and my mother are getting married. Yes, yeah, such a horrible thing to react to. Tell everybody that before the day is out, we shall have a wedding. Or a hanging. Either way, we ought to have a lot of fun, huh? Truly, the world hasn't witnessed such a travesty since the Hindenburg disaster. Oh my god! Joe, I am so sorry! How can you afford these things? And apparently he was calling out for Tessa, too. Which... I mean, when you understand everything that happened by the end of the book, this is beyond melodramatic. Hardin hates his father, and not without reason, but this is, like, once you pause to gather up everything and you look at it all in hindsight, he is such a little bitch! Now, dude, you're a little bitch. I am not! It gets worse when you realize the actual property damage that Hardin is committing might not be restorable, like the China and whatnot that he's going out of his way to destroy in what is effectively a, a huge temper tantrum in a house he doesn't live in. Like, this is actually criminal. Hardin's like the one spoiled kid who just decides to ruin Thanksgiving for everybody else. Grab me if you want, nothing will unfuck the Thanksgiving turkey. And don't expect him to have an ounce of remorse. Aw, oh, aren't you two something? You both are so predictable. Poor Harden is upset, so you gang up on me and try to make me feel bad for breaking some shitty china. He draws with a sick smirk. I thought you didn't drink, I ask him and cross my arms. I don't. Until now, I guess. Don't try to patronize me, you're no better than me. We get this really conflicting image, considering the context of the scene, in which Tessa says, And it's scary, but I can't deny that being near him, even in his drunken state, breathes life into me. I have missed the feeling Harden gives me. He is a violent drunk and has destroyed who knows how much of someone else's stuff. At this point, I really want to know, is Anna Todd okay? Do we need to call somebody and get her to safety? This isn't normal. This shouldn't be seen as acceptable. Conflating Harden's violent drunkenness with this flighty feeling breathing life into Tessa is not a good image to have. I don't think that Todd intentionally did this, but what she is doing is she is effectively conflating drunken violence with romance. This is in a way, kind of normalizing abusive behavior. Again, I don't believe for a second she is intending to do that. But that's very much how this reads. 
Harden tries to explain himself and talks down about his father, and we get some insight to why he doesn't like his dad. You don't know him. He doesn't give a shit about me. You know how many times I've talked to him in the, in the last year? Maybe ten. All he cares about is his big house, his new soon-to-be wife, and his new perfect son. Harden slurs and takes another drink. I stay quiet while he continues. You should see the dump that my mum lives in in England. She says she likes it there, but I know she doesn't. It's smaller than my dad's bedroom here. And apparently Harden's dad also used to be a drunk and would drink at a different bar every night. And now he is uh, like the chancellor of the college somehow. I don't want to say that that's impossible with the right connections he'd be able to make it work, but it really does make me question, how did a drunk guy in England become the chancellor of a university on the other side of the planet? You got pissed drunk, ran for president, and won. <laughs> how long have I been drunk? You've just started your second term. <laughs> but that's not the lesson Tessa takes away from the moment. She thinks that Harden's dad left when he was 10 and was a drunk, just like her father. They have so much in common. Yeah, we both have so much in common. We both love soup and... Uh... Parental alcoholism, the cornerstone of any healthy relationship. I'm also confused because Harden says that his mother insisted or practically forced him to come uh, to the university to be closer to his father. If the father was really that bad and his mother still loved him, as Harden seems to think, then why force Harden to go to this college? Why force him to be nearer to his father? I'm getting a lot of mixed messages and they're not answered in this book. Maybe there's an explanation later in the series, but right now it's not a healthy image. Tessa goes unusually out of her way to try to help Harden. I'm not sure why, because she hasn't demonstrated the social aptitude that would make this understandable within her character, and she doesn't like Harden. In fact, she was the one to break communication twice in the last few conversations she's had with Harden. So why is she here in the first place? And during this entire time, Harden is just throwing barbs and insults at her, trying to be as toxic as possible, and eventually Tessa kind of gets enough and kind of leaves to go help Landon clean up, and she gives a character assessment of Harden, and she's almost correct. I should scream at him for the hurtful things he just said to me, but I know that's what he wants. This is what he does. He hurts everyone near him, and he gets a kick out of the chaos that comes out of that. Tessa assesses Harden's personality, and she's partially correct. She says that Harden hurts others and gets a kick out of the chaos he causes. I think that's partially true, but it also allows him a built-in defense for why things don't work out for him. It's not that he's an unlikable prick with shitty social skills, it's that he intentionally pushes people away because he doesn't need them, or so he would claim. It's not that people have rejected him in mass, it's that he rejected them first. This is a coward's play. This, uh, he's not failing because he tried and didn't succeed. He's failing because he never stepped up to the plate. I like to dig in with psychology every uh, now and then with character studies because it allows new avenues to discuss things and try to understand why certain characters would act certain ways. Harden is behaving in accordance with something known as loss aversion bias. While normally utilized as an understanding in economic theory, loss aversion, loss aversion bias is when you don't uh, take a certain investment because you're worried of losing something. Let's say you've got a buddy who's had a number of failed business attempts or get-rich-quick schemes, and he says, hey, if you just loan me a hundred bucks, I'll be able to pay back tenfold in two months' time or something. And he's never actually fulfilled that promise before, despite uh, the number of loans you've given him. You could very easily reject his idea on the basis that he wouldn't be able, uh, he wouldn't be a very good investment. You are too worried about losing the money, so you don't try to sink anything into it. Effectively, you can do the same thing with emotions. Harden is not risking any vulnerability with anybody. He is closing himself off to everyone emotionally, which is why he doesn't open up or see things in an intimate light. It's why he doesn't see kissing as a potentially romantic act. It's just making out. It's why he doesn't date, so that he can't get close to people. It's not that they reject him, it's that he pre-rejects them, 
and just does whatever he wants. That way, he, in his mind, never gets hurt. Now, the counter to that is that he also never gets any real emotional fulfillment, and he never is able to get real emotional support out of anybody else. But if he's damaged enough, he's not going to be able to tell the difference. Now, do I believe for a second that Todd put that much thought into her character? No, I don't. I'm just pointing that out because I like to delve into psychology. It also demonstrates who Harden is effectively, and I don't want to make this comparison, but I, I thought about it while I was reading it, and it just works too well. You know who else uh, I have seen demonstrate this exact same idea? When he wrote his fourth book, he came in with the author's note at the start saying, I intentionally wrote this bad, so all your criticism is now pointless. So, um, Hardin Scott is more or less a stand-in for Onision. They both display loss aversion bias to an incredible degree, uh, to a rather dependent degree, I would argue, and they refuse to make themselves better people as a result. It's not that they can see what their uh, chaotic personalities do to other people, it's that they don't care. It also feels kind of out of character for Tessa to even come out here in the first place, but it's one of those moments where if she didn't, then the plot wouldn't happen. And again, Todd had to sacrifice character in order to get the story that she wanted, even though it doesn't actually work with the character types that are in play. It feels like the reason Tessa had Noah stay behind wasn't because it was natural for her character, but because he would have just interfered with the scene or the development for later in the book. When you need to interfere with your character's decisions because the plot doesn't work out, otherwise, rework your plot. Don't sacrifice character for the sake of story. It very rarely works out. Tessa steps inside to try cleaning up the place, uh, cuts her finger on a bit of glass, and Harden steps in and leads her to a first aid kit and tries helping her out. They talk a little bit, Harden has some self-pitying dialogue, and eventually Tessa gets Harden to admit that it's been about six months since his last drink, so that whole I don't drink thing was an absolute lie. Add another inch to his height. Harden also, in a roundabout way, uh, confesses that he thinks he's a good person, at least partially. Still staring at the ground, his face is serious. You think I am a bad person? What, is he that drunk that he would ever consider himself good? Yes. I'm not. Well, maybe I am. In a moment of bad timing, but I saw this on TV once, Harden and Tessa start going back and forth again. Harden's real personality starts to come out. He demands that Tessa not turn his back on him, and she's like, why the hell am I even here? You are a piece of shit. And while she's explaining everything, Harden runs in and cuts her off by kissing her. But I'm cut off by his lips against mine. I push at his chest to stop him, but he doesn't budge. Every part of me wants to kiss him back, but I stop myself. I feel his tongue trying to pry its way in between my lips, and his strong arms wrap around me, pulling me closer to him despite my attempts to push away. It's no use. He is stronger than me. Kiss me, Tessa, he says against my lips. I shake my head, and he grunts in frustration. Please just kiss me! I need you! Ridiculous imagery aside, this does reveal something very important about the relationship as a whole. His words unravel me. This indecent, drunken, terrible man just said he needs me, and somehow it sounds like poetry to my ears. I think I finally see what the appeal is supposed to be in Harden. It isn't his assholic nature that draws Tessa to him, it's that he makes her important. He's a broken man who can be passionate when he needs to, and that breathes a life into Tessa she's never known before thanks to her sheltered upbringing. Harden is a project to fix, and Tessa is the only one who can do it. And that is such a terrible lesson on so many levels. If we're talking small things like a guy just needs a little bit of confidence so that he can perform his violin solo in front of others, that's, you know, harmless enough. Harden is a violent, abusive drunk and has shown no real remorse for his multiple infractions, flip-flops at the drop of a hat, and is entirely unreliable in pretty much every metric you can measure him by. Harden is not a quick repair job. Harden is a demolition project. Four, three, two. All right, here comes the implosion. Implosion? There is a line that people can cross where you have to realize 
you are not worth the headache. I'm getting out of here. So Harden weasels his way through the conversation and eventually says that he wants to be good for Tess, whatever that means. Now, is he capable of being good? Honestly, I doubt it. Harden Scott is one of the worst characters I've ever read about, and that is me saying that after coming off the heels of reading 365 days. Think about that for a moment. Harden tries expressing some degree of vulnerability here. Tessa says, I know I must have misunderstood you, and he says, no, you didn't. You make me feel something unfamiliar. I don't know how to handle these types of feelings, Tessa, so I do the only thing I know how to do. He pauses and blows out a small breath which is be an asshole. Am I wrong? You're not wrong, Walter. You're just an asshole. Okay, then. Tessa claims that she has some degree of self-respect and she refuses to be Harden's plaything, especially when it involves being treated like dirt. Go ahead and try to count how many times she allows him to step all over her. Tessa remembers that uh, she left her boyfriend alone in her dorm to go visit this guy and Harden uses that against her. Harden starts begging Tessa to stay with him for the night, and she thinks, I find myself nodding before I can stop myself. And what will I tell Noah? He is waiting for me, and I have his car. I can't believe I am actually considering this. Just tell him you have to stay because... I don't know. Don't tell him anything. What's the worst thing he can do? I shudder. He will tell my mother. Without a doubt. Irritation toward Noah fills me. I should not have to worry about my boyfriend telling my mother on me, even if I do something wrong. Y'all understand why I hate Tessa as a person? She is objectively in the wrong at this point, and she is presumptively telling, uh, telling herself that Noah is annoying for worrying about her. Oh my god, what a bastard! How dare he! Look, Noah is, at worst, clingy and a little possessive. He deserves way better than Tessa. And despite knowing that her boyfriend, who she begged to visit her, is alone, stranded in her dorm, she decides to stay with Harden for the night anyway. Harden leaves Tessa up to his bedroom, which is adorned with a four-poster bed with dark linens centered against a far wall, and looks like a king size with at least 20 pillows on top, totally contradicting his tough guy exterior. Harden strips down to his boxers and asks, You're not going to whine about sleeping in bed with me, are you? No, the bed is big enough for both of us, I say with a smile. I don't know if it's Harden's smile or the fact that he is wearing only boxers, but I'm in much, uh, but I'm in a much better mood than before. Now that's the Tessa I love. He obviously doesn't mean it that way, he's just being facetious, but it's still a pretty odd thing to say. Harden once again tries sexy talk and says, I don't know why no one has fucked you yet. All that planning you do must help you put up a really good resistance, he says, and I gulp. Apparently she's never had to resist anyone, because she was hit on a lot, but no one ever tried to have sex with her. And apparently she and Noah were well-liked and both voted onto the homecoming court every year. Also makes me wonder how she can think of Noah at the moment and not cringe from betraying him, but... I guess Tessa doesn't have a heart. You like the way I talk, don't you? His expression is dark, but so sexy. My breathing hitches and he smiles again. I can see the blush in your cheeks and I can hear the way you, uh, your breathing has changed. Answer me, Tessa. Put those full lips of yours to use. Well, all right. Ow, not there! Don't go sticking it in my second pair of lips I use for playing musical instruments! Tessa ends up stripping down to her underwear and wears one of uh, Harden's t-shirts as a uh, nightgown, I suppose. But Harden isn't done putting the moves on her. And worse, Tessa doesn't resist him at all. I know he's drunk and that's why he is being so nice. Well, nice for him. But right now, I will take it. If this is truly my last time around him, then this is how I want to spend it. I keep telling myself that. I can behave however I want tonight with Harden, because when the daylight comes, I am going to tell him never to come near me again, and he will oblige. She's had a little bit of alcohol. I don't think she's actually drunk in this scene, but Tessa is effectively giving herself permission to cheat on Noah again. It really makes you wonder, how many times is she going to do this without recourse or guilt? Tessa then initiates sexy time contact, and credit where it's due, this does sound like a character who
who has never gotten beyond second base before. Can I, um, touch you? Okay, so I've got to be really careful about how I phrase this because YouTube is wildly inconsistent with its monetization policies, but this leads to an outside the boxers old fashioned and it's written in such a weird PG-13 way that I could probably actually read it verbatim. You don't really get any enticing sexualized words. Like the prose is incredibly vague. Things like she tightens her grip or she keeps her movements slow and tight and he seems to like it. Very vague notions, but you still get an idea of what's going on, which again strikes me as an author who wants to write a sex scene but doesn't have the confidence to write a detailed sex scene. Or doesn't know how. Take your pick. Well, she um, helps him arrive, and he has to go change. Good heavens, I'm arriving. I don't care if anyone wants to try to defend her. I will argue that Tessa is absolute trash. If it was, like, just hormones and such, then maybe I could excuse that, but Tessa is too self-aware in the moment and doesn't face any kind of negative repercussions for what she does here. She sort of does, but not in an enjoyable context. It's... You'll see. This book is a mess. While Harden goes off to change, Tessa considers checking her phone, but decides against it. The last thing I need right now is to read texts from Noah. He is probably panicking, but honestly, as long as he doesn't tell my mother, I don't care as much as I should. And if I'm completely honest with myself, I haven't felt the same about Noah since I kissed Harden for the first time. How is anyone supposed to like Tessa? Why does this book have fans? Harden comes back. And Tessa asks if he's still drunk, and he says, No, I think our little screaming match in the yard sobered me up. So, alcohol was not a factor, apparently, in the old-fashioned scene. After they've talked for a little bit, Harden offers to return the favor and taste the rainbow, as it were. Lick the rainbow! But Tessa ends up getting embarrassed and frustrated because of her hormones, and nothing happens, so they both go to sleep. Some indeterminable time later, uh, Tessa wakes up and slips out of bed, uh, noting how peaceful Harden looks, despite the pieces of metal in his face. That's a line. Harden apparently says Tessa's name in his sleep, and Tessa leaves and runs into Landon, who is apparently still awake. I don't know what time it is now. Rather than suspect anything, Landon just thanks Tessa for coming over and helping. Oh, he is so nice. Too nice. I almost want him to tell me how disgusted he is that I stayed the night with Harden, that I left my boyfriend alone in my room all night after I took his car and ran to Harden's rescue just so I feel as bad as I should. So this makes me wonder if Tessa actually has a moral compass or if she needs an external voice in order to feel guilt. Maybe her mother shouldn't have cut the umbilical cord. After an extremely brief breakdown, Tessa has a quick cry with Landon and then drives back uh, in Noah's car swearing that she can't lie to him, and less than half a page later, she's lying to him. Again, we don't know what time it is right now, but Tessa walks into her dorm. Uh, Noah is still awake, looking up at the ceiling, and says, Jesus, Tessa, where have you been all night? I've been calling you nonstop, he shouts. This is the first time Noah has ever actually raised his voice at me. We've bickered enough, but this is a little scary to me. I am so, so sorry, Noah. I went to Landon's house because Harden was drunk and he was breaking things and the time just got lost, I guess. So by the time it cleaned up and it was really late and my phone was dead, I lie. Now, an interesting thing that I find is that uh, even though a page ago, Tessa says that she wants Landon to lash out at her so that she feels as bad as she should, Noah does pretty much that. Considering context, I don't blame him, but Tessa doesn't have the reaction she Sounds like she thinks she should. I thought you were going to stop hanging around those type of people. Didn't you promise me and your mom that you would? Tessa, they aren't good for you. You've started drinking and staying out all night, and you left me here all night. I don't know why you even had me come here if you were just going to leave. He sits down on the bed and rests his head on his hands. 
They aren't bad people. You don't know them. When did you become so judgmental? What do you want? What do you want? It's not that simple. What it's do you want? So where's the need for guilt all of a sudden? You have now cheated on your boyfriend in a very significant way, very much at his detriment, used his car to cheat on him, abandoned him, and you have the audacity to give him lip? Todd tries to make Noah look judgmental by, you know, calling Harden and Steph and the rest of them goth people. And while that's a little out of line, perhaps, Noah isn't wrong at all in this scene. He's out of line, but he's right. And what do you know? We've got a nice dramatic twist as Harden shows up to Tessa's dorm. Now what's really impressive is Harden walks in and looks at Tessa and demands, you snuck out on me while I was asleep. What the hell was that? And despite everything that Tessa has done against him, Noah walks up, gets between Tessa and Harden and says, don't yell at her. Honestly, great boyfriend moment. He stepped up to defend somebody even though he was upset with them. That is, Noah gets a brownie point. Harden decides that he doesn't want to lose the situation and he doesn't care who he has to hurt in order to get his way. So he demands that Tessa tell Noah what happened last night and says, tell him Tessa or I will. And Tessa starts to explain what happened. Noah pretty much figures it out and kind of has a breakdown. And you know what? Again, I don't blame him. And again, I don't understand, like, the character motivation here, because Harden says that he doesn't date anyone, and we know from contextual clues that he's afraid of getting invested with anyone emotionally, and despite that, Noah leaves to, you know, get back to his car and get out of the area. Tessa starts to chase after him, and Harden grabs her and says, If you go after him, I'm done! Tessa says, Done with what? Fucking with my emotions? I hate you. You can't end something that never began. And by Harden's own rules, that's true. They're not dating. They're just messing around a little. So I really don't understand what Harden's position here is. What is his motivation? I mean, I know ultimately what it ends up being, but it doesn't make sense in context in this scene. It is so confusing. I, I can understand the relationship in The Mister. I can understand the relationship in Twilight. I can understand the relationship in 365 days. But this book was so badly planned that it's like character motivations just turn off and on at the slightest flick of a switch at the author's convenience for the sake of heightening artificial drama. It is so bad. Anyway, Tessa leaves and catches up to Noah just as he gets to his car. And he says, I can't listen to you anymore. And Tessa begs for forgiveness, despite the utter betrayal that he has had to endure. Noah says, I just need some time. I don't know what to think right now. And says that he still loves Tessa. Kisses her forehead and then leaves. It's kind of stupid, but it's the kind of youthful romance that you can get into when you're that young, so I can still buy this as a motivation. And Noah strikes me as the type of naive who would go along with something like this, despite Tessa's being a horrible person on almost every measurable scale. Tessa goes back to her dorm where Harden's waiting, and the first thing that he says when she gets in is, I'm not going to apologize, and she knows he isn't. This morning, I see that he is just a terrible, hateful person. There is nothing good about Harden. Something that the rest of us could have told her about 150 pages ago. And despite this revelation, she will continue to hover around him for the rest of the book. Who am I kidding? The rest of the series. Harden continues to press Tessa and, in like a roundabout way, seems to argue that he's better than Noah and despite his whole I don't date rule, argues that Tessa makes him feel something that he can't really describe. Tessa breaks down, uh, cries, Tarden won't leave no matter how many times she begs, and it's not until Steph walks back into the room and Tessa asks Steph to make Harden leave that Harden finally relents and Steph drags him out of the room. 
But not before ending the chapter with an evil villain speech. I will stay away from her, but don't bring her to any more parties at my house, he snaps, and I hear him stomping off. As he goes down the hall, his voice recedes too, and he yells, I mean it! I don't want to see her again, and if I do, I will ruin her! But you know, my undertaker will destroy him at SummerSlam! Oh my goodness! And that is the end of chapter 37. We are on page 184. I am Oh, maybe a third into this book. Unfortunately, we're gonna have to call it there because it is getting a bit late. I've been filming for several hours and there is so much more that we have to discuss. It's gotten pretty bad. It gets worse, if you can believe it. It gets vastly worse. So maybe we can wrap this up in part two I don't know. It might have to be a three-parter, three but either way, thank you for sitting in as long as you have with this one. Special thanks to the patrons, and because I forgot to mention it earlier, thank you to everyone who has watched the 365 Days review, despite YouTube limiting ads on it, which has artificially limited its reach, even though I don't have anything that's really objectionable. Everything is censored to high heaven, and everything that I use to censor the video is monetized elsewhere on YouTube, so what the hell, the best I can figure out, because they haven't told me why it's blocked, is that I used 50 Shades of Grey in the title. YouTube is a dumb, dumb site. Fortunately, I've got my patrons to fall back on. Y'all are awesome. Thank you for the financial support, because God knows I need the therapy after reading this crap. So. Join me next time as we explore the true depths that Harden Scott is willing to descend to in order to get his little bitch ways.